Hi, my name is Alex Wiseman from Lehigh University's uh, College of Education, specifically the Comparative and International Education Program. And we are going to be talking today about some basic statistics or quantitative analysis ideas. Uh, this is the uh, first of these screencasts. And let me just say that we're, we're really dividing it, uh, our quantitative uh, part of our discussion, uh, into two sides, a descriptive statistics side and an inferential statistics side. And we're going to start with the descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics simply means that we're describing numerically the variability in the data right here. That's important for us because it helps us think about what's going on in the data, what the information is telling us, but we're thinking about it using numbers. Descriptive statistics are also a way for quantitatively summarizing information. So we're going to be summarizing the information numerically or quantitatively. And the way that we do that is we summarize the way that the data varies. Right? So that's descriptive statistics. Later on we'll be talking about inferential statistics. Inferential simply means that we're making inferences from data by estimating relationships or drawing conclusions about a larger group based on results from some portion of it. So this larger group, but we're going to take a smaller sample. Um, methods for generalizing from a sample to the larger population from which the sample was drawn are really a, a, a lot of what we're doing in inferential statistics. So we have these two sides, descriptive and inferential. Descriptive being simply summarizing quantitatively or numerically variability in the data. Whereas with inferential statistics, we're trying to estimate or draw conclusions about a larger group based on what we know about a smaller group. Those groups we call populations and samples. And if we're doing uh, analysis with the whole population, we call them parameters, because those are the characteristics of a population. If we're doing it with just the sample, we call it a statistic, which is the characteristic of a sample. So the population is the whole group, set of cases from which a sample is drawn and to which a researcher wants to generalize, whereas a sample is simply a smaller set of cases. So let's say that we have uh, the whole world. <laughs> There's my version of a world. And we're doing all the people in the world. These are all the people around the world. Well, if we want to draw a sample, we simply select a smaller group we take them out and then we analyze them, in this case quantitatively, uh, and that would be our sample. And we then try to generalize about whatever it is we find about that sample back to the larger population. And there are ways to do that appropriately that we'll be talking about in future screencasts, but that's the general idea. The sample is something that we always want to carefully think about whenever we are reading or consuming the research literature and whenever we're conducting our own research as well. The sample and the kind of sample and the conditions for collecting the sample and the, the characteristics of the sample have a huge effect on the kinds of information that we're going to get from our statistical analyses and so that should always be one of our major concerns. We also need to know the distant difference between variables and values. Variables are characteristics or properties that differ in value from case to case. And if we're measuring those values quantitatively, we generally call them scores. And all of the scores for a set of values is the scale. When we talk about levels of measurement, there are generally three, uh, although I'm combining number three and four here. Uh, but we can talk about nominal, about ordinal, and then about interval and ratio. For the purposes of comparative and international education, um, there are certainly times when distinguishing between interval and ratio will be appropriate for an intro to research in this field. It's, it's okay to combine them together. And this simply is how a variable is actually measured. Let's look a little more closely. Nominal variables have unranked categorical values, like gender or religious affiliation. So gender would be male or female. Religious affiliation could be Islam, Christian, Buddhist, atheist, whatever we want to say. 
right? So these have unranked categorical ver ver values. There's no reason why male or female is ahead of the other or greater than or less than the other. Same with our religious categories. There is no way that we can rank them, right? That, that's not possible to do with these kinds of nominal or name values. Ordinal variables have values that can be rank ordered but are not based on a standard unit of measurement. So we can rank who's the fattest, or we can rank who came in first, second, third, fourth, fifth in a race. So, for example, let me just uh, erase my marking so far. If we, if we have, let's say we're running a race, and we have uh, three people racing, one person finishes the race in one minute, one finishes the race in three minutes, one finishes the race in ten minutes. Right? We have a first place, that's supposed to be first, <laughs> we have a second place, and we have a third place. Right? This would be the way the ordinal values are measured. First, second, and third. Now, the reason why this is ordinal and not interval and ratio is because the distance between first and second place and the distance between second and third place are not equal. This distance is two minutes. This distance is seven minutes. They is, they're not based on a standard unit of measurement, first, second, and third. Forget the times for a little bit. We're just looking at first, second, and third. So they're ranked but they're not standardized. Hmm. Interval ratio takes it a step further. They're rank ordered, but they're also based on a standard unit of measurement. So if we do height, let's say in centimeters, or we do temperature in Fahrenheit, or we do test scores in simply, uh, let's do percent correct. That's a percent. These are all based on a standard unit of measurement. We know exactly what the difference is between one unit and another. So if we're going from one centimeter to two centimeters to three centimeters, unlike first, second, third up here, we know exactly what the distance here. It's one centimeter and then it's one centimeter. Or the same with Fahrenheit. One degree Fahrenheit, two degrees Fahrenheit, three degrees Fahrenheit. It's one between each of those. Unlike here where it was really two and then seven instead of just one, two, three. So why is it important to identify the level of measurement in variables? Because you have to use that to choose the appropriate statistical techniques. Eventually we will be talking about how we use level of measurement to choose the kinds of analyses we want to do with the data. But you have to know what a variable's level, level of measurement is in order to choose, in order to begin that process of choosing the appropriate statistical techniques. So although we're not, we're not here yet, we are here. <laughs> but unless we get this down and we understand level of measurement, it will be very difficult to choose the appropriate technique. When we talk about the values of variables, there are different ways of measuring them. One is discreetly and one is continuously. Variables that are discrete are measured with separate distinct values. So let's do uh, test scores, but we're just doing points, right? And the points are, let's say they're whole numbers. So you score 100 or you score 89, right? Or you score, you know, 50, right? It's distinct what these are. And there's a limit to them. Let's say the maximum score is 100. You have 100, um, you know, points that are possible because you're using whole numbers and you're using a point system. If we did test score, but we're now doing it in terms of percent correct, it becomes a little different because we're looking at how the variable is measured now with an infinite or at least a very large number of values. So for example, um, we could talk about 89% correct, but we could also talk about 89.9365% correct. And you could keep going 
uh, on these decimal points as long as you want it. So it helps us to measure as as closely as we need to because there is an infinite or a very large number of potential values to measure this variable with. I'm going to skip over some of these. Uh, some of these we did in class. Let's talk for a minute about mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive categories. Whenever we are looking at categories for measuring variables, we have to make sure that the values for those variables are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So let's go uh, back to gender. Gender is generally measured as male and female. Now, are these mutually exclusive these two values, male and female. Is there a condition in which each, each case has only one value on a variable? In other words, these values do not overlap. The question to ask is, could someone who's responding to a gender question, you know, what is your gender, could they potentially answer both? I'm male and I'm female? Well, in uh, today's society, there's a possibility that they could. But if we change this to sex because gender is socially constructed sex has to do with your biological state and in particular your reproductive and sexual organs are you male or are you female it's a much more distinct categorization where it is now mutually exclusive right? it wasn't necessarily for gender because gender is socially constructed it is more likely to be mutually exclusive for sex because sex is a biological measurement of maleness or femaleness. Is it collectively exhaustive? In other words, are all the values of a variable included, all possible cases? Again, if we're talking about gender, male and female doesn't necessarily fit that because we could also have transgender, we could have, I mean, there are many different categories. Let's just go with transgender. That, that, that's enough to make it male and female, not collectively exhaustive. There are other categories that people could answer in relation to gender. However, with sex, it's difficult to say that there is more than one possible, uh, or more than these two possible values for the variable. You're either male or you're female. Either you have the reproductive and sexual organs of a male or of a female. And so the, all of the possible values are in there. Let me erase my ink for a second. Let's consider uh, another one. Let's make sure. Uh, number of books in the home. Number of books in the home. This is a question that's asked on a lot of different international uh, educational assessment background surveys. Um, students will be asked to estimate the number of books in their home, and it's used as a proxy measure for socioeconomic status. The more books in the home, the more socioeconomic status, the, or the higher SES uh, a family has and a, and a student has as a result of that. The fewer books in the home, you guess where this is going, the lower the socioeconomic status for that family and student. It's not a perfect measure, but it's a measure. And the way it's usually measured is categorically. So there'll be 0 to 10. There will be, let's say, 11 to 50. There will be uh, 51 to, let's say, 100. And then we'll have greater than 100. All right, so it's a categorical variable. And students will answer that I have books within one of these ranges. Now the interesting part about this is that is it mutually exclusive? Well, we've made it so it is. There's no overlap between these categories. Is it collectively exhaustive? It goes from zero to infinity. <laughs> so yes. But if we change this to 10, we have now made a mistake because you could have 10 books in the home here and 10 books in the home here and it is no longer mutually exclusive. 
These are some of the basic introductory terms and ideas related to vari variables and values, and we will continue in our next screencast.